OK, good evening, um, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I hope you can all see uh, OK. At the moment, my screen is still showing that you've just got a holding page. So hopefully you can see James and Martin with me. So um, I would say welcome to all of you for listening. Um, as always, our webinar series is supported by SAS Analytics, who we're very grateful to. Um, and I'd like to firstly welcome Martin Cross, um, as I'm sure you all know, Olympic champion from 1984 well-renowned uh, rowing journalist and world rowing commentator. And he's going to be speaking to us this evening um, and asking James Harris, who's with us as well, um, some questions, and I'm sure some probing questions there at some point. Um, and I'm sure, as you know, again, James is our GBRT senior women's coach who coached the silver um, medal winning Olympic eight at Rio. Um, I'll hand over in a minute uh, to the guys and I'll leave you to um, to listen to them and I'll come back at the end um, with any questions. So as with all our webinars, if you look on the right hand side of your screen, you should have a number of webinar options, the bottom of which is chat. So if you have any questions um, that you'd like to ask of James yourself that isn't covered through the webinar, if you just log them in there, I'll monitor it through the session and I'll come back at the end um, with any questions that can arise uh, or that may arise from that. Um, as always, it's recorded, so um, you can listen back as well at your own leisure. Um, so I won't waste any more time. I'll hand over to James and Martin and hopefully if I close my webcam, um, I won't lose you all. So uh, James and Martin, over to you and thanks very much. Thank you, Loretta. I've been really looking forward to chatting with you, James, and uh... Just wonder, in these strange times uh, for rowing coaches, what's your coaching day been like today? If you could just uh, give us a sense of what life looks like for you in lockdown. Uh, well, currently uh, a lot of childcare, actually. Uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> so as I'm uh, building some uh, coaching principles around uh, looking after two uh, young children. But um, in terms of the day to day, uh, it's been, pretty much touching base with the athletes probably a couple of times a week um uh, some zoom calls um one of the ref really refreshing things at the moment's been kind of allowing the guys to like just get on with the track there is a training program set but it's just they're in their environments they've got the kit that they need to do land training and just allowing them to get on with it and sort of like almost they're taking a lot more ownership over their own training and trying to like understanding the various elements of training and, and themselves, particularly in this quite challenging different time. Um, and just sort of nutting out those kind of like little challenges they face day to day. And the, the when they get on a roll, they get on a roll and sometimes they don't, but it's, it's been quite refreshing uh, to be sort of a number of steps back from their, their training and only being a only being accessed when they need it as opposed to being in a confined environment at Cavisham presents where you you you're there to coach them as opposed to at the moment there's a bit of separation which allows for sort of some more depth to the conversations probably can you say something about how the different members of the women's squad have adapted to this whole lockdown routine because it's not been at the same pace I gather no, so like it's really it's been really interesting because different people, different personalities, different home setups. Some people got off to a flyer um, in the in the first stages of it, and then got niggles and injuries, and we don't have physio cover, so they they're used to having physio cover to keep them training, whereas they don't have that. They have to look after themselves. Um, yet there's others that started steadier and now. So we we uh, officially stop training on the fifteenth uh, and all have of July and I'll have some time off. Uh, and now the sort of ends in sight. They're like, oh cool, I can do this. I can train on my own for four four weeks. So I've I've, I've figured it out after twelve weeks. So there, there there's been nuances in that, but it, it it's been refreshing to kind of be able to discuss and challenge and just support the guys through this because it's definitely from me as a coach trying to give them enough space and and support them and it's definitely more 
in the sort of health and well-being of the guys than the performance. It's been we're, we're the furthest we've been away from Olympics for quite some time once it was postponed, and that that's just allowed a little bit of perspective, a little bit of kind of everybody to relax and kind of like make sure they're okay and healthy and, and also give them time to make sure their families are all healthy and okay in this challenging time. Yeah, so a, a lot of them will be living with their families, I guess, or, or some of them are even like polyswan working. Yeah, so <laughs> when, when I think Cavisham closed, we closed Cavisham on the Saturday, the country went into lockdown on the Monday, and by the Wednesday, the Olympics was uh, postponed. Uh, and they scattered all over the country or like a few went back to Northern Ireland uh, there's a few in Scotland and like you say that um, uh, Polly, Polly Swan and there's a couple of uh, uh, Rebecca Girling she's a social worker they both they, they um, uh, started working pretty much straight after the, the close down and uh, so and we supported them through that as well because obviously that's very important at the moment yeah, I, I just think one of the things uh, that, that just occurred to me, James, I hope you don't mind me asking, is um, that British Rowing released Tom George's record-breaking ergo score on, on Friday. I wonder what you thought of that being released, because normally I get the impression everything's closed in and secret. Uh, I, was, I wasn't aware it was going to be released. That was, yeah, and it, I think it happened uh, a good few weeks ago now. Oh, um, did it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That like it's um, yeah, may, maybe almost a month ago, but um, that was so. Yeah, that was like Jürgen was very, very happy with that score, um, <laughs> and uh, the yeah, it was, it was fantastic. And we've had a number of PBs from the guys during lockdown doing 2K PBs in their kitchens and uh, 30 minute tests in their kitchens and the like and like. On the patio in various locations, uh, but yeah, that that was quite extraordinary. That score. Yeah, yeah, absolutely amazing, and and love, lovely to be able to see it as well. I I, I just wonder um, with the women now, are, are they asking you, you know, when are we coming back, James? When can we get on the water? I don't know if any of them are out in singles at the moment, but are you getting those sort of questions now? So we've uh, the. They're able to go on the water in the singles uh, out of their local clubs uh, at the moment. Cavisham remains closed. Um, they probably, I, I, I would have thought they were going to be more keen to get back, but obviously I work with the sweepers and, and there's a little bit more of the, well, we can't go in pairs yet. And the, the, the sort of, and they need, the pairs are at Cavisham and Cavisham's closed. So I think, yeah, just, I, I was expecting them to be keen to get back, but I think because they're in quite a good routine, because the the training's going well, that they're, they're a bit more kind of well. We know we're safe in this environment. We know we're 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 progressing back to the first of September when it go when when we start uh, properly at Cavisham. Um, but that's it, yeah, there there hasn't been as many. I, I thought they'd be banging down the door trying to get on the water. However, some of the scholars have been banging on the door trying to get out on the water. Although once they were out, they were like, oh, okay, cool, I'll go out once or twice a week now, yeah. <laughs> as opposed to once or twice a day. So it's been. Is, it, is there any sense with some of the other nations? I know New Zealand have been out on the water for, for a while, the women's eight there have been training. Is there any sense, although I think now they're on a break, to be fair? Mm -hmm. um, but is is there any sense that um, GB is somehow missing out here because things happen later? I think we've been so collectively with the coaches, with the and the leadership and, and the athletes have been really clear in terms of this period being about what what can we can we do as opposed to what we can't we do, and we could, we they've got all got ergos, they've all got some form of weights, that, and we've pushed the sort of physicality of this period. Um, quite strongly, and and like I say with Tom George's ergo, uh, it, it's paying off in areas for sure. Um, I, I, I've, it, it surprised me that kind of like the athletes haven't really been looking at other nations and being concerned, which is really is really for refreshing because I know in the past we've had if somebody gets a fantastic training camp venue, 
athletes who go, oh, that, that's better than this training camp that we're on. Uh, okay. And whereas it's been quite refreshing, they're just, they're, there's a little bit more calm to it. But like I said, I do feel being quite a long way away from the, from anything really crunchy, they're, they're a bit more, okay, we know we can train on the ergo. We know we're going to have time to train in the boats. And then, then we go to town on that. And uh, I, I, I personally, I don't know what would have gained from being on the water in this period now, other, other than chat the challenges of um, the social distancing, like the, the cleaning regimes and stuff that would potentially have taken the edge off the quality of the training. Yeah, that's a really interesting answer, James. I, I'd like to take this opportunity to just sort of little retrospect in terms of how you came into being a lead GB coach because you know it's not necessarily uh the path that some of the other team have have been uh followed into the squad so um if you can take us back to the heady days is it in gateshead i was in uh teesside on uh, stop sorry. stop yeah stops and on tees <laughs> yeah so, so yeah how did you make it uh so well, I uh, just would be the, uh, the the honest answer. So, so I started working for British Rowing back in 08, 09 um, with a club and coach role. Um, and then the uh, the world class start role came up in the northeast. And I think I managed to get the application in at about midnight the night night before the, uh, <laughs> the application closed. And and I was forced to by my wife <laughs> like to to get it in and at the time i thought oh, okay this is, i think i think i was about 22 at the time and i thought wow this will be um a reasonable kind of like i'll, I'll get a gauge on what's required from a gb start coach uh so um but yeah then got the job which was uh, quite pleasant and um within a reasonably short space of time was working with a good group of athletes and part of that was um nathan adams worked there previously and had got a good group up and running and then uh, and then it was um uh sort of added to uh over the sort of four years that i was there and one, one of them was cat copeland uh, wow. around 2010 i think she started with us there so you you're, you're working with cat copeland but I guess it's still. I don't know if you look at it look at it like this now. I guess I'm thinking that it's quite a big jump to be a star potential coach to being a coach with the GB team. I mean, how did that come about? Um, so Cat Cat did did what Cat did in uh, 2012 with that fantastic result, and probably the year after I was doing a reasonable amount of development coaching with Shep and. Uh, the under 23 women's eight at the time um, and yeah I think it just kind of like talking to Paul Thompson talking to David Tanner at the time and just sort of they they saw some potential in my coaching and and um, went with it I think really would be the and uh, in 2014 I started coaching uh, with the senior team which was a big step up would be yeah. like it's very like it's very different from being at a tiny it's not a tiny club to to be fair, a small club in the north northeast of England uh, to walking into the office at Cavisham with the likes of Tomo Jurgen, uh, Robin Williams, uh, Darren White, uh, Rob Rob Morgan, Christian Fakel. They're like people who've won uh, Olympic medals, like co coached Olympic medals, and that that was quite. Uh, daunting at the time for so I, I guess I guess in part from from David Tanner who was the then performance director and Paul Thompson they saw you as as uh, someone who could be developed and someone almost you know like they could anoint as this guy is going to come through in the future <laughs> or hope I think they uh, yeah they <laughs> I think I gave them a headache anyway that's for sure they uh um, yeah, they, like that, both David and Paul absolutely supported me through that the, that period, and uh, particularly like uh, David's uh, been a mentor to me since he uh, since he stopped the uh, performance director's role in 2018, 2017. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, and yeah, there, there was definitely that kind of sense of they saw uh, aspects of my coaching that were um, that that suited the team, that suited the performance environment. Um, yeah, and went, um, went went with it, <laughs> which was very fortunate for me. I do feel very lucky to have had that opportunity. So I know 2014 was probably quite a challenging year. The championships were in Amsterdam. It wasn't the fastest British women's eight I seem to remember of um, the last few years. I mean, what were the challenges for you coming into the team as uh, as a as a young coach? So I think the so previously to sort of coaching in the team was very much coaching a small group of single scholars really. Uh, in, and developing single scholars with good people to uh, people who are learning to row uh, through the winter and then the summer was almost like coaching in the 23 boats was very much a bit of a smash and grab you sort of had four weeks you're given these athletes and right go like and, and I'd sort of got in I felt that I'd got into a good sort of pattern of how to do that whereas with going into the senior team in 2014 was very much like like you're coaching a squad and with with an eight the there's 14 athletes usually give or take that roll through that eight over a season and all the whole season is developed with these group of athletes to perform and what one of the things i think from the first world cup to the world championships is about four months and it, there's quite a long time to either get it right or get it wrong. And I, I think that kind of, I, I can remember in the 2014 season really hitting the ground running in the fir, for the first, I think it was Europeans. And, and I was like, ah, we've got this. Like the, the, guys are, the guys are in a good place. They're working well together. The speed was all right for that sort of part of the season. But then it, it never really kind of <laughs> progressed from there. It just like, I, I didn't really have the skills uh, and the tools to kind of uh, sort of bounce off the challenges that came up. So, diff so Polly Swan was in the women's pair, then came into the women's eight, which naturally you go, oh, that will strengthen the women's eight. Whereas yeah. the challenges that that faced and, and Polly's situation of missing out on the women's pair to Heather Stanning was quite significant that I, I I just was too young, naive, and hadn't seen it at all. And and one of the things I didn't use the the other coaches around me at all very well uh, back back in that 2014 season. I was I was definitely sorry. No, I I found that absolutely fascinating. I mean, I I just I'm just wondering what would need needed to have been different for you to actually to have used them i mean was it more self-confidence self-belief or did you have too much i mean what was what would have been the key to unlock that i probably gave out um some like self-confidence <laughs> like some bravado but but i think the 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 biggest thing was probably just um like i'd gone it like i said before like going into that office where there's just coaches that have won multiple medals um i was just out of my depth in terms of the sort of and didn't and you know you didn't have the confidence to know which way to turn and who who might go like give me support and who will go oh shut up you're a you're a little uh little small young young coach like you need you need to find your way and i don't I, that, that that was always whereas i think actually reflecting on it now I could have asked anybody and they'd have probably uh, given me a decent amount of support in it. Yeah. So it's it was a steep learning curve then was that sixth place result. But, you know, sixth place wasn't going to be good enough to qualify the boat for the Olympics. And the next year came with tensions all of its own at Egg Ballet, the championships in an Olympic qualification year. So how much did did you feel that sort of tension in yourself as a coach? um so it's really like the one of the things i was reminded and have been reminded throughout the career uh work at work career as a team coach has been how important it is to qualify the eight for the olympics because it's nine seats plus two spares plus so if that's it's half the team which means then it's half the support staff as well that go with the team so it's quite significant and uh, I was reminded that multiple times throughout 2015 and 
2019. Um, and one of the, the, the moment the pressure dawned on me the most, probably, and the most in my coaching career at uh, senior level would be, was before the rep in Ed Billette, one of the athletes got off the ergo after doing their warm up and uh, wandered over to the boat and I was just polishing, like last bit of polish, make sure the heel restraints are uh, done up. It's not, it's not flash, uh, well, <laughs> the senior coaching, it's just the same, but it's, there's, a, there's faster people around. And uh, the, the athlete came up and went, oh, um, just thought I'd let you know, uh, I've had a back spasm. And, this was, <laughs> and, and, and like, my world dropped. <laughs> and it was, uh, and that moment where, the, fortunately we have a doctor and a physio around, but it was that moment where you were, uh, there was three crews in that race, in the rep, with two through, and I knew it was going to be a canvas between three crews that they'd shown all year that, that it was going to be close. And just to go, right, we're boating this boat now. And if we come third, it's done. And if she if if this back spasm doesn't go away and it gets worse, there's no way uh, we're going to not. Um, like, we're, we're just not going to qualify for the Olympics and that's game over. Uh, and yeah, I've never been so nervous. And we boated her. And fortunately, Anne Redgrave knew, probably could see the uh, colour had drained out of my face and went, it's okay. She, like, if she can touch her toes, she'll be fine for at least an hour. And we had like <laughs> minutes. So it was it was one of those ones, like, oh, okay, fine. Yeah. And they, they won the rest. And, uh, in, that, in that race, James. So uh, Romania, Russia, and us were. Um, and uh, the Roman, no, the Russians went out then, did they? Oh, the Romanians went out. Romanians yeah. went out. Oh, that was a wreck from hell. Mm. <laughs> and your your rate was going significantly quicker, I think, that year. They sh it shown some genuine pace, hadn't it? Yeah. So I think, like, probably so the 2014 year was definitely like the, they weren't far. They they weren't they didn't show speed in the, the their training of the level that was required. Whereas 2015 was really the year where I thought ah, actually we're, we're starting to look like a metal zone boat and and the the time the period where that kind of really sparked was off the back of an awful European Championships where basically everything went wrong and uh, like it was the start of the year start first race of the season we'd gone right okay we need to we need, we need to prove ourselves after uh, Amsterdam and step up and uh, the Cox got ill on the flight out. We had to fly another Cox out. We had to, we had a broken wheel. We had a snapped blade. Uh, 500 meters from the finish line, uh, our bow girl caught a crab in the final. Um, so we came fifth, and <laughs> it was just one of those ones. You're like, oh, okay, cool. This is this senior coach in Malarkey is it isn't getting any easier. But what was really refreshing and fortunate was the girls' response after that and we had three weeks where it was fantastic like really got stuck in some of the training speeds were really good it was the first time over short distance the eight had really kind of got stuck into the women's pair prognostically um and yeah they went they went to Varese three weeks later for a world cup and led the americans who hadn't been beaten um uh all, for about yeah. 10 years whatever it was the uh, the and they led them until the last 250 and and the Americans did a 555 and the uh, we did 556 which was about four and a half seconds faster than the British record um, and like that absolutely that speed put us bang in the ballpark for being competitive trying to maintain that for the rest of the season was a different <laughs> question. Can you look back on that on that time, you know, and, and it's fascinating how you talk about, you know, your athletes rising to the challenge. But as a coach, what what are you putting in that, that leads to that 556? Can you can you sort of distill it at all and say, well, it was I was really on my ball technically or, you know, I was a good motivator or what was what was going on? I think so from the from the motivation bit, I think the motivation came from right. We've messed up. We need to uh, step up now. I think, from as a coach, I think my kind of understanding of the guys had got to a level where I knew I could 
press go really i think it was it was one of those ones where you kind of became much more demanding of them in that period and it it saw it was a little bit closer to what i'd done previously with the sort of smash and grab of uh, an under 23s where actually right we've done the basics right now we can step the standard of the basics up a notch and expect them to stay there and and actually that kind of just started to create more and more moment, momentum with it and that like once they started to produce speeds that they knew were world-class speeds that kind of unlocked more and and i think what as a coach i was able to do was just keep that momentum going i wouldn't have said oh, i was uh, we were able to do this with the catch or with the finish or whatever we, we had a really good simple model that i wouldn't sort of shy away from but that that was kind of it was more just the ability to just keep the the ball rolling uh, once it started to roll in the right direction well, one of the things you said which was is really interesting is is what it feels like to have you know standing and glover as training partners but just the sense because they're always up there on top of the prognostics on top of the percentages so it you know it really did mean something to actually get the bows the eight bows in front yeah so what one of the i'd say one of the differences between this cycle compared to last cycle is having the pair there or not having the pair there and helen and heather were just insanely good at their the training like they and where it came from but the consistency of delivery in the training which meant they were a really good target boat so you, you just knew that if you went about if you were ahead of them on prognostically well that must be good like it, it, it was it was going to be good and and even if they had a bad row for them is still like gold medal standards would be the so so the the bandwidth they played in was a really good benchmark just to chip away at and the more the more uh, throughout the Olymp uh, the 2016 olympiad just the eight just got that little bit closer all, all the way along and and yeah it was good when we started to frustrate them basically the eight was going well if we were frustrating them but so you were fourth in 2015 and then i guess just missed the medal zone but um expectations so when did it become clear expectations in 2016 were going to be for a medal or higher um i think so we the the 556 in Raisi was a big kind of shift in actually this is not we might scrape a bronze if we get it right this is actually if we get it right we can be competitive at the front end of the field so i think that shifted the focus into medal zone and what whilst not qualifying a boat uh with the women's quad in um uh, 2015 it like for the team isn't great but actually for the boats that were qualified and particularly for the eight that became a massive advantage because because of having the women's pair that were selected and then there was a women's double that actually there's four people for two spots that gets selected quite early it meant then everybody else and the the everything else was going into producing a, a top eight which just meant the competition for places the focus on and delivery on on that was just heightened so much more than when it's one of seven boats it's all of a sudden one of four boats which just meant the level that we were able to operate and develop uh, was so so much more significant and you you hit the ground running with um the european championships which i know was a win but it didn't it wasn't the, the win in the manner that you would have liked i guess um so one of the things and it, one of the things that was always a concern with that eight was the ability to get into the race and it and it, it transpired in the final in Rio. But the the at Europeans, we've done a lot of work with the previous sort of month in terms of getting out into into the race and, and having a really strong first half. And the weather was awful, massive cross uh, head. But we I think we're about two two one to two lengths behind the Russians and the Dutch after 500 meters and we were at rate 32 after about 10 strokes which it was just one of those ones you had right 
brilliant, here we go. Like this has just started disastrously again. Um, but sort of as as the race went on, it because it was a long race, because it was really challenging, actually, they'd got into their rhythm and then as it went through the thousand, I thought, oh, okay, maybe we'll come back. And they came back really strong and and won. But it was it was just one of those ones you're like, right, that wasn't really the performance to go with the result. Like and, and particularly with the crews. Um, the Russians and the Dutch, particularly at that point, were, they weren't medalist crews at that stage. They hadn't shown anything that was medal worthy uh, through through the cycle so far. And it was like, OK, well, we're a canvas up on that. Whereas if it would have been a length up, that, then yeah. the start of the season, we go, OK, cool. Right, here we go. So. And uh, the eight, um I seem to recall in the women's squad with Victoria Thornley and Catherine Granger, there was uh, quite a controversial set of circumstances which kind of must have affected your crew and the psychology somewhat. Um, so I reckon it was a, we played a blinder there would be the, <laughs> and probably got two medals out of it, fortunately. But I think that that, that was really challenging for the guys obviously Vicky had decided that she was uh a, want, wanted an opportunity to be in the eight because at that stage through the train in the eight had been outperforming the double and was more in line with the pair so it became more of the second boat at that stage um and yeah she 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 wanted to get involved and uh, one of the things that actually I think was really powerful for the eight was all of a sudden they were fighting for their seats again after having yeah. created a unit and trained in a unit they had to fight for their seats and one of the things i can remember sort of the day or two after it sort of broke that she she was going to get an opportunity to uh, seat race for the eight was that the guys went well the only way we're gonna not like not allow this to happen is to beat the us in uh, lucerne and they and it, gone it had gone to right well, we'll have to win it then like and and which was a really useful thing at yeah. that stage it wasn't like oh well, it'd be good if we get a medal it was like no no the only way when this isn't going to happen is if we win it and that was probably the closest i think anybody got to the us that season was uh in lucerne um a re really good race and they rode really well and uh, and then yeah then 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 they went seat racing a week later uh for their seats which was uh, it also very interesting. And, and the eight by then had developed this personality of a, of a sort of sassy crew. <laughs> um, yeah, that came about because I think Polly Swan said it in an interview after um, the Europeans. <laughs> and uh, it was like one of the things that was really powerful with the group was the fact that they, their, team, their, like the, their teamship was really strong and that they developed real trust and um harmony between them all and that that just sort of typified it that she went oh it's sassy and then that just became the sort of outward projection to to the media and to uh the rest the rest of the crews as opposed to i don't think they were that sassy inwardly they were they were very <laughs> they were very they were very uh focused very um uh supportive of each other but just allowed a bit of edge the outward going edge which was interesting and you know when i know you're an athlete as an athlete the first sort of time you get to olympic games there's all this talk and preparation about don't be put off by the glitz and you're here to do a job and everything i, I don't know if, if first time coaches get that kind of input or that kind of you know advice what, what was your situation going to rio well we did we uh had a really interesting meeting probably six weeks out maybe maybe eight weeks uh about so all the first timers uh got together and had a meeting about what their expectations were going to be which included me and uh i think four of the girls and then the uh, the old guard which was uh tomo and the, the the other girls had so we then got told what to expect whilst we also sort of communicated what we were expecting and that was quite powerful because in this meeting we had with the the new guard they just went Wow, it's all right. We we know we're going to hold our heads better than them lot, so we'll be fine. <laughs> and there was just a, there was a like the, the the youngsters. They weren't they weren't all young, but the 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 newer ones in had just an like a bit more of a, an edge 
to them with that and I think it was like yeah, okay you can tell us what, what it might be like and the cameras and this which is all very useful but there was just that little cockiness to it which just I think balanced it out quite nicely um, and the other thing for me at that period we we also went through quite a tricky time off the back of the Catherine Vicky um, stuff and then I, I was diagnosed uh, with cancer around eight weeks out from the games um, which was interesting uh, to, to say the least so for me that was really kind of like I, th I think I had nine days off coaching but it was just the first time I think in, in, in my life that I'd realized that we're not all superhuman and uh, we are we are all human and uh, like illness and sickness don't, doesn't wait for anybody and like I think uh, there was two two elements to that. I think the the perspective it gave me, probably having a cancer nurse going, look, don't worry about when whether you're going to be on the plane to the Olympics or not. You need to get better and really like proper. Poof, and you're like, okay, this like, fortunately, I'm like it was caught early. Fortunately, like it had a good prognosis. It was it like there was. I was in a good place for that, whereas I was just like, right, this is somebody telling me to actually suck it up and do like and, and yeah. it's like the olympics isn't the be all and end all and and to be fair that kind of stayed with me and i can remember walking into the stadium and the the lagoa and christ the redeemer's looking down and you like you go this is this is this is awesome just to be here like and it was yeah. and and actually probably compared to probably the year before at the world championships the pressure that i felt was just nothing compared to it which i think was was really fortunate we like so we had a good eight we were in a medal potentially in a medal position first medal from a women's eight and actually it was probably the least pressure i'd felt through it for a while because of the sort of the yeah. simplicity like oh wow this this is going to be great whatever like i hope we don't mess it up like I've managed to make it make the plane and like and, and I think to be honest the guys I think felt that a little bit as well was like they were like oh, okay well we there wasn't because of the Vicky thing we, one of the girls had lost their father in the lead up to 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 the games and there was there was a few things actually they got there and went let's enjoy this now like and it, it did it did help would be there it, it seems one of the theme, one of the themes listening to you, James, is, is the ability of yourself and, and the group that you're, you're coaching to, to take challenges and bring them and learn from them and move on. And, you know, there, there's been a few key times that you've said, you know, oh, this happened, you know, we got a bad result there or I was diagnosed in this case and, and that you've accepted the challenge and then you've kind of integrated it and moved on with it. Yeah, I think like. Somebody just got. We, we had a women's eights uh, meeting uh, the other week with the Rio eight and the current eight as a light, um, uh, over Zoom. And um, one of the things one of the girls said is like, actually, like elite sport, Olympic sport isn't about um, the ability to be the best of the best of the best. It's actually to be as good as you can be and deal with as many challenges that get thrown at you. And I think that's kind of where I think if if I was going to like part of my coaching is like actually how to athletes, how to cruise, how to, how do we overcome things? Because that's like most, most of the challenges what's in front of you. Like it, you like the, the opposition will be as fast as the opposition is, but the way to be as fast as you can be is uh, as a crew is to overcome the challenges, whether they're training, whether they're personal, whether like, and yeah, just how, how we buy into that. And I think, the the challenge with that is having good enough relations with the athletes to not for them to trust the direction that you're suggesting and also for me to trust the direction they're suggesting because there's plen plenty of times over the years where um an athlete's gone i think we should do this and you go well, okay like and uh that's that's the direction that you go so yeah how good was your pre-race talk for the final <laughs> um i like basically as they got better the pre-race talks became blander would be the like, it's, it is like it's one of those ones where you just go yeah that like 
because you know what you're going to get so you don't really need to talk about what you're trying to get you like and yeah it just it got more and more simple would be that like and and about one or two key points the the thing i can remember i can't really remember what was said in that but i can remember the night before the girls were talking about um the like all oh, this will be the last training day for some of them because they're retiring and stuff and it, i just can remember being like look you're not going to be in any better rate than this like unless you unless you're here four years in four years time so really enjoy enjoy this 4k or whatever it was and, and the sun set in and ever like and uh just trying to trying to bring some enjoyment into which for some of them was their third or fourth olympics and their third or fourth time trying to win a medal and they were in they were in the position and trying to keep people calm in that position is really like is, is a challenge there's not like i wouldn't say i wouldn't say i'm awesome at that or anything it's just uh, you, yeah if, <laughs> you, hope, you hope that they're going to be okay like, you must have loved you as a coach though because all the all those sort of capacity to deal with things and uh you know keep focused yeah I, I, love is a strong word i think yeah, the, uh, yeah as, a, as a as a coach you have to like i think respects probably like is but like I th because you have to be able to support them at the right time when they need support but you also need to be able to massively challenge them at the right at the right time as well and i, I can remember having a couple of arguments with uh, a couple of them a couple of weeks before the games and one was about the speed that they'd been operating at and basically being like we'd missed an opportunity and one of them disagreed and when when at it would be the uh, um whilst another one felt uncomfortable and pro and we had a full stand-up argument about it and it's just like how like i say there's no uh, there's no sort of secret formula to it but it's just trying to get that balance right between like support and challenge like because yeah. uh, to, to to move it on so just moving on then again from you know the years sort of 2017 18 and 19 have, have brought their own challenges in terms of you had a lot of women stopping and um the eight is has not been as high profile as that silver medal since yeah it's been it, like it's been uh eye opening would probably be the 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 big the biggest thing for me because of like that first olympiad with the team like the the challenge of 2014 and then uh, building into rio was fantastic whilst it had its challenges and then this this cycle you almost not like probably a bit of naivety at the beginning going okay well okay we've got a new fresh group of people right let's let's go with like but then try understanding the nuances of okay you've got like we've only got two returning medalists two returning olympians uh, and i think out of them one has done the olympic qualification regatta before um relative to the previous cycle where half of them at least were had been to the olympics and done and done that and won medals at world championships so it's just that level of experience in in the team and i think one of the challenges of that is just the underlying confidence of the group which so and and as a whole that's been quite challenging one of the challenges as well as we've had changing leadership as a, over over three or four years um and that for me it's been interesting because say with paul thompson i sort of built a really good working relationship with him through to 2017 2018 when he left um but as that relationship got stronger it became harder to have good quality relationships with the athletes because of whether it's a selection alignment in selection and whether the trust and sort of do you have their back or are you just a team coach and that that's really that's one of the biggest challenges from going from outside the team to inside the team is how athletes perceive you are you like because a lot of the time athletes have a coach that is totally behind them and then like and, and uh, i'm going to get selected and this is and all of a sudden it's a team coach that while it are my best interests 
their best interests and that and it's just it's been fascinating but one of the benefits of uh the past probably year is um like because i haven't worked with Jürgen before like i'm not seen to be as aligned to Jürgen as i was with paul so yes. at actually the athlete relationships have, have improved and uh like that's a bit anecdotal but it, it, it's that that's the feel and the, the, the sense that i get which um has developed quite strongly and we the, the apes of the past three years have been faster than the apes of 2014 uh, and 15 in terms of training speeds. Um, it's just really, it's one of the, it's really hard to get a group of new athletes that like you want once a year, you have a real big crunch race. And if they don't quite get it right in that big crunch race, you have a year before you can test it again. And that like, and how, and how you develop that's, it's the hard thing. I want to. I want to just talk about that, but just take you back a little bit. You know, in terms of working with Jurgen, because it's an interesting appointment that Brendan Purcell made in terms of you know Jurgen's responsibilities been with the men. How does it work across two squads? How do you? What are you learning from him? What's he giving to the women that the women perhaps haven't have be, had before? I think like. It's, it's been fascinating because obviously his programs tried and tested for years and years and years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no disrespect. It's been around a long time and he's seen a lot. And I think that sort of uh, where I think he uh, has been really interesting and fascinating is how he develops his relationships with the guys that he coaches. And also then through the program, how he, how he manipulates and manages the program has been really insightful. And I, I, I think I've been privileged to work with two of the best chief coaches in the game with uh, Tomo and, and then with uh, with Jürgen and just the differences. So say Tomo, I thought, I think the way he worked with his staff and his coaches was like, was bang on. Whereas I think the way Jürgen works with his uh, athletes like and, and is like just some of the conversations i've heard him have i'm like whoa okay this is like and everybody's different and different personalities but it just yeah. like, i've seen world-class things from both of them over time and that that's just supported it and i think with in terms of what jürgen's brought to the women's team i think like i think the simplicity of the training is very physical and i do like i think with the new group that we had the physicality was lacking uh, uh, and, and it, I think it's just added to the physicality and, and we might benefit from the fact that we've uh, you, we're going to be racing the Olympics a year further on because, yeah. because of the development that we might make with a new group. Of, so you, you qualified in in 2019 with, with a fifth place but it, it's interesting that that sense of um, although you qualified I know that wasn't the sort of race you were expecting. And you spoke earlier of, you know, the big race mentality, and this wasn't it. So as a coach, I guess, I don't know, how do you see it with some of the athletes, either maybe they're relieved they've qualified, they've beaten Romania, or maybe some are frustrated. I know you were frustrated, for example. Uh, prob that was probably the most angry, frustrated disappointed i've been in a race because uh, we'd done some really good times in training they'd operate they they'd dispatched of i think the romanians and the dutch in the uh, in the rep re by 500 meters they'd put a length on the field and that that was the first time a gb women's eight that i've coached has gone and done that and and had the capacity almost had the capacity to do that and also row row a race after it um and i think that yeah the with the new group with with forming a crew particularly with there was just too many different kind of perspectives on the race and that and i think for some of them it was their first a final they'd ever been in like at world championships for some of them they, they've won silver medals at the olympics a couple of them were in there they, they were, whereas yeah there was just this odd balance of relief that they'd qualified frustration that they hadn't performed at their best and disappointment and i and i i 
it's probably the most challenging post race uh, debrief that I've had to do because I just, I just didn't know what way to pitch it because it was just one of those ones where you're like, with these new guys, they've qualified and it is it is a big deal for them to qualify. Whereas, but for our kind of group and the way they'd been performing and stuff, that just wasn't good enough. And it was it like it, it was hard. It was like and and there's there were. They've not been huge amount of times, but when you're in that period, like the adrenaline's pumping, you like it's the the end of the season, and the next day they're on a on a flight to holidays, like and to try and get that kind of right, uh, like it's really hard to sort of just get the right words out when when the emotions that high, and yeah, that, yeah. that's something, to, <laughs> something that similar to the the athletes, they only have one big race a year you only have one big debrief uh, <laughs> like that's in it is like the, and you can get it right or wrong like that's yeah yeah i mean from the outside the women's eight looks incredible at the moment i mean there was that race between new zealand and australia at the front of the field which was phenomenal and then the americans the all, all conquering americans that were world champions the previous year getting a bronze medal and then you know, there's yourself, the Canadians in the field, anyone who's got to qualify. I mean, it's a stellar event. I mean, what can you see looking forward to, you know, if the Olympics happen next year in 2021? I, th like, I think I agree. I think the standard of the event, so it was it was open in 2017 off, off the back of 2016. And uh, it's been refreshing to see the standard of those sort of four or five crews really step step it on and i think they bring bring the bring in the kiwi women's pair into the the kiwi women's eight boom, there's a top yeah. top top pair the world world's best uh pairs in in the event and the australians have got a good pair that's in there as well and uh yeah you just see the sort of standard creeping creeping up and up but at the same time I, I, like an olympiad's a long time particularly with a group a, a women a, an eight and i think getting that balance right between building performance and and creating momentum really like is hard over that period of time and i think yeah you, that i see that a little bit across most of the events at the moment there, there seems to be a standard but who's of that standard just changes year on year a little bit at the moment because there's more nations seem to be able to produce those top end boats, but who produces at which time and, and getting the time in right is, is going to be key. And everybody's totally unsettled now uh, with with the change in uh, change in time scale. And I think just to wrap things up in case there are any questions or anything, James, um, for yourself, uh, what, what are the, the your personal challenges as a coach that, that lie ahead? I mean, what sort of mountains have you yet to climb or um things yeah. to look I, I think it's, it's like one of the one of the things for me is to, like how to keep developing and i think one of the one of the things that i've tried to do over the last eight years or whatever it is now um is to create create kind of an ability to keep developing whether it's through the coach education stuff or the like or this uk sport uh courses where just to give the athletes a sense that i'm trying to improve as well and i think it's quite easy as a coach sometimes to go right i know what i'm doing boom do it this way okay you didn't you did it or you didn't do it and i think particularly as a young coach and i think i'm only just now uh older than most of the guys i coach <laughs> whereas in real wasn't at all i think their awareness of the stri striving to improve yourself is is important and i think because there are going to be challenges there are like people are going to like you people aren't going to like you there's like and the opposition doesn't get any slower like you said the, the, the people are pushing the performance boundaries and and yeah, just the ability to just keep keep developing, keep the crew developing, the team team developing, and and the the individuals within it. I think that just keep that momentum rolling throughout is probably the biggest thing.
That's been absolutely brilliant, James. I think, should we go back and see, uh, we can wind things up there if there are any questions for you there. Hi guys, thank you so much for that. I've just, I've been sat back enjoying it. I was, oh, quick, where's where's my webcam button? Um, I haven't had any questions pop up um, from those that are listening, so I'll give people a minute to ask a question if, if there are any. Um, but I wonder if I could just come in with one, James, if that's, if that's all right, Martin, if you let me. Um, you mentioned um, there something that I found really interesting around um, the respect that's important to generate between you and your athletes and, and how that needs to be sort of both ways. Um, and you also talked about getting that balance right between offering support and, and pushing the buttons and challenging them. And I just wondered, I know you said there was no recipe uh, for getting it absolutely right, but is there anything you would particularly pull out that you feel you've either learned through um, either the sort of previous Olympiad or through any of the education programs that you've been through that has helped you develop a tool or a skill to to manage that balance? Um, pro so the the bit that's probably kind of the one of the benefits of this period, like which there's not many, but the one has been having time to reflect on things. And one of the things that's come up in that is almost, and I think it's important to take forward as well as probably when a, when it's been going well, I've probably done it, is um, really separating time for reflection and time for action, if that makes sense. And I think with with coaching, you can get a little bit either stuck in one or the other, like and and uh, that kind of ability like when when uh, when I was working as a start coach there was barely any time to breathe between sessions and you just go from one to the other and you're just in like a oh, coach coach do push with your legs do this do that um whereas just having an ability to go right there's periods where I'm going to do stuff and like coach whatever it happens to be rig boat um and then the the times where just to go right I'm going to step back right are we doing this as well as we can do this are uh, Am I building the right sort of relationships? So, like, is the eight going as well as I think it's going? Because when when I'm in the moment, okay, well, the speed looks all right, but am I missing anything in that? And I think that's probably the kind of where the balance comes in is the action and then reflection, just to keep 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 con constantly finding a balance with it. But just yeah, do do it for a week, back off for, and and review it for three days or whatever it happens to be that works for people. And there. Thank you, Jane. So maybe some coaches can take that away as a bit of a, a top tip to, to carry on once we're back into rowing and, and back into the training. Um, no one's popped up a question. So I think, Martin, you've done a sterling job of, of, of uh, probing James there for some information. I certainly found it really entertaining and I hope those listening did. Um, all I think that's left for me to probably say is thank you both so much for giving us uh, um, the time this evening. Um, I know it's not easy with with little ones, particularly James, at this time. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Um, I hope that we get to see um, everyone out on the water soon. Um, I look forward to hearing your commentary uh, in the not too distant future, Martin, hopefully with some racing. Um, so all that's left for me to say is thank you very much. Don't forget you can listen back. And if you do have any questions that you want to pose to James, I'm sure we can forward them on um, after the session. And uh, the video will be up on our YouTube channel um, shortly. Um, and don't forget, we've still got a couple more webinars coming up before we finish this series of lockdown webinars. Um, so hopefully um, we'll see some of you then as well. So thank you very much, guys. Good evening. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Bye. Bye.